So now that we've talked about the three different measures of central tendency, I want to talk about how you know which one is appropriate and the effects of skew on our mean, which ends up being one of the most um, highly selected measures of central tendency. So in the graphing lecture, I talked to you about distributions that were skewed. And remember, I told you that you can tell whether it's a positive or negative skew if you think about where a skier would go. So remember, in this up here, you can see a skier is going, not a base jumper, but a skier is going to be skiing towards the negative numbers, which means that this is a negative skew. And the one down below, it's skiing towards the more positive numbers, so it's a positive skew. Well, now I'm going to explain to you why it's called a negative and a positive skew. When we look at this distribution, see the mode would be here because that's the most frequent response. So that means the, the peak of the distribution is where the most frequent response is. So that's representing the mode. The median it might be in here because half the scores are on the right and half the scores are on the left. But based on this distribution, these scores down here, when we add up and divide by how many people there are, these low scores are going to pull the mean down. They're making it look like the average was much lower than it really is up here. So that's why we call it a negative skew, is that the mean is being pulled towards the negative direction. Similarly, like if you saw a graph like this, let's say this could be like house costs, right, or housing prices. So here's the most common house price, and then half the homes are less than this, half the homes are more than the median. But you can see homes like maybe, let's say, Oprah's home or Bill Gates' home. There are very few of those, but they are very expensive. They're going to pull the mean upward. So that's why this is called a positive skew, is because the mean, if it were to truly be a good measure of central tendency, the mean is actually too high. It is being pulled into the too positive realm. And so that's why it's called a positive skew. And so the mean ends up being the score that we use for future inferential statistics. It ends up being the score that we really rely on. So the skew, the words positive and negative skew, are really indicating how poorly the mean does in representing the data. You can see here that this score here does not do a good job in representing the entire picture. So that's why we say it's negatively skewed. So just like in your own lives, if someone said, hey, you're presenting a skewed picture there, skew has kind of got a negative connotation, or a, sorry, a bad connotation for us as well. So the mean being skewed is not a good thing. The mean being skewed positively up here is not a good thing because it means that it's not really representing where most people are, and that's the goal of the measure of central tendency. So if all our equal. If you find that the mean, median, and mode are, are all the same, that's great. Then you can just go with the mean. If it is not a, a vastly skewed distribution, the mean is good. However, if you see a distribution that's positively or negatively skewed like these two are, then really the mean is not the ideal measure of central tendency. In this case, the median would be a better score. See how the mode is interesting, the most frequent score, but it doesn't really give us the entire rest of the picture of the distribution. But the median in this skewed distribution seems to be doing a good job at kind of representing everyone. So if you have a positive or negative skewed distribution and you can only pick one measure of central tendency, the median would be the way to go. I argue if you have a skewed distribution, give your readers all three and let them decide. But in this case, the median would be the most appropriate measure of central tendency. Um, now let's talk about how you can use different data um, for different types, or sorry, different measures of central tendency for different types of data. So remember we had nominal, ordinal, interval, and ratio. And I, I grouped interval and ratio here because they're analyzed the same. So they, we, they're both considered numbers and we treat numbers the same. But nominal and ordinal actually have different representations here. So let's think about whether we can use the mode, median, and mean for all of these types of data. So let's first start with the mode. Can I have uh, a most frequent response for something that is nominal? So an example of nominal data would be your religion. Can I have a most common religion? Oh, I guess I'm starting over here with interval ratio. <laughs> so can I, have, I apologize, can I have can I have a most common score for a number? Interval and ratio are numbers. So something like dollars in your pocket. Can I have a most common dollar in the pocket? Yes, I can. Let's think about ordinal data. Um, freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Can I have the most common response was freshman? 
Yes, I can. Now let's talk about nominal data. Nominal are just words that don't have order. So something like religion. So can I have a most common religion? Yes, I can. So just right off the bat, we can see that mode is quite an accommodating measure of central tendency. It can handle all data types. Now well, let's move on to median. Uh, for numbers, dollar in your pocket. Can I have a median dollar in your pocket? Yes, I can. Can I have a median uh, class standing? So freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Can I have a median freshman, sophomore, or junior, or senior? So I'm going to say, yes, you can under certain circumstances, right? So if you have an odd data set, so there are seven items, then you can have a middle um, representation because uh, three of the items will be on the left, three of the items will be on the right, and the one in the middle will work as your median. So you could have um, freshman, 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 sophomore, junior, senior, senior. And in this case, freshman would be in the middle because there were three on the left and three on the right. Um, the other circumstance where median would work for ordinal data is if it is the same response. So let's say I have five scores and three of them are freshmen. I could say freshman, 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 senior, senior. Oh, sorry. I meant if it's even. <laughs> I'll start over. Let's say I have six scores. I'll make it easier. Let's say I have four scores and it's freshman, 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 senior. Well, the two middle scores are freshman and freshman. So I can say that median is freshman because I don't have to do math on freshman plus freshman divided by two. I know that it will be freshman. But if it's an even data set and it flanks two different responses, like a freshman and a junior, there's no way to have a halfway between a freshman and a junior, so the ordinal wouldn't work, median wouldn't work for ordinal data. So that's something to, to keep in mind. It, it works well, but not for all ordinal data. All right, now let's think about having a median for nominal data. So I had said religion. So can I have a median religion? So remember the first step for calculating the median is putting them in order. So we first put them in order and then we count in and figure out which one's in the middle. So if we're thinking about religion, is there an order to religion? Or is there one religion that goes first? Is there one that has to go last? And the answer to that would be no. Religion does not have to be in any order. It could be in alphabetical order. It could be in order that it came about in history. Um, it could be in popularity order. Sorry. So there's no defined order of religion. So therefore, you cannot calculate the median for nominal data. All right, so, so far the mode is a great measure of central tendency. The median is nice. It gets a little wonky in here for ordinal, but it's really not accommodating for nominal data. Now let's think about the mean. So can I calculate the mean dollars in your pocket for interval or ratio data? Yes, we can. Now let's talk about freshman, sophomore, junior, senior. Can I calculate the mean freshman, sophomore, junior, senior? So remember to think of the steps. I'd have to go freshman plus freshman plus freshman plus sophomore divided by three or four or whatever it is. That. So clearly I cannot calculate the mean for ordinal data. So it won't work there. And then let's think about religion. Can I add religions up? Right? And then divide by how many religions there are. Nope, those are words, they're not numbers. So we cannot calculate a mean for nominal data. So even though the mean ends up being the end-all be-all for statistics, so we're going to use it a lot in the future, it's actually the least accommodating measure of central tendency for the different data types. So if you are trying to report a measure of central tendency and you have nominal data, the only thing you can do is mode. If you have ordinal data, you can report the mode or the median under certain circumstances. But if you have numbers, you can report all three, and then um, usually the mean is the one that we use moving forward. All right, so these are all the important pieces that we need to know about the measures of central tendency, and the best advice I can give to you moving forward is practice, practice, practice. Look at different data sets and see if you can figure out what's the mode, the median, and the mean.